the Imperium. Untold millennia have passed since humanity took their first tentative steps into the dark void of space. Stellar empires have risen in glory and fallen in ruin, but always mankind has endured. Now it faces its most desperate war for survival against an endless onslaught of horrors bent upon the absolute destruction of the human race. Mankind is beset. The shadow of damnation spreads across the stars. The waning years of the 41st millennium are an age of constant war in which history, reason, and hope are ground to dust beneath the inexorable weight of the passing years. Enlightenment is replaced by superstition, understanding by rhetoric, rote and uncomprehending prayer. All that remains is war. For all of this, the Imperium is the single largest and most powerful empire in the entirety of human history. A million worlds are said to labor beneath the Imperium's yoke, and at their heart lies Holy Terra and the divine God Emperor interred forever within his golden throne. This vast domain is envisioned by its rulers as a solid, unified whole, its star systems divided into segmentums and sectors, its populace united by bonds of species and by the overarching imperial faith. The High Lords of Terra, the Ecclesiarchy, and the Adeptus Administratum issue edicts of rule in the Emperor's name. Countless mighty armies and potent battle fleets answer their call. So is the dominion of humanity wrought upon the heavens themselves. So works the Emperor's divine will. The reality is rather different. The Imperium is in constant flux, worlds vanishing amidst howling warp storms or annihilated by invading terrors even as new territories are claimed by rogue traders and explorator fleets. Imperial crusades surge across the stars, driving back their enemies or vanishing in the bloody maelstrom of war. The Imperium is best pictured as many thousands of tiny candles scattered far and wide through a dark and hungry void. Some burn bright or burst into vibrant life, even as others flicker, waver, and are snuffed out. Each Imperial world is the fiefdom of its planetary governor, permitted to rule however they see fit so long as their tithes continue to be delivered on time. Many are despots, tyrants, or inbred incompetence. Even the worthy rulers find themselves separated from the next human world by distances measured in light years, forever beset by invaders from within and without. In such conditions, even the most equitable of rulers needs to become an oppressor if they hope to keep their people alive. Interstellar travel and system-to-system -system communication in the Imperium are entirely dependent upon the strange dimension of boundless energy known as the warp. Yet though mankind has exploited the energies of the warp to spread across the stars, it is from this hellish realm that the greatest threats to the Imperium have emerged. Malevolent entities flow from within its dark currents to drive loyal souls to heresy and madness, or to manifest as monstrous beasts that ravage the worlds of real space. Everywhere the warp touches, insanity and boundless mutation follow. And the twisted worshippers of the dark gods of chaos are rarely far behind. 
Nor are these the only threats faced by mankind. Countless alien species teem through the darkness between the stars. They ravage humanity's far-flung domains, even as they feed their rapacious appetites or expand the boundaries of their own Xenos empires. Still, the warriors of the Imperium continue to fight on beyond all rational hope of victory. Theirs is not a war for honor, freedom, or the promise of a better tomorrow. It is a battle for survival, a tooth and nail fight to see the next day dawn, a defiant scream into the hungry void that humanity will never, ever give in. There is no room for hope in this nightmarish future, no time for compassion or mercy. There is only war. The Imperium Sanctus Though certain that the opening of the Great Rift was the work of foul heretics, few in the Imperium know the truth of how or why this catastrophic chain of warp storms erupted across the galaxy. It is clear only that the Imperium is split apart, torn in two by a roiling belt of malevolent empiric energy that has left the Emperor's realm divided as never before. The vast galactic region known as the Imperium Sanctus is the half of humanity's realm that fared better in the wake of the Great Rift's opening. Of course, in this time of nightmares, better is a comparative term. Consisting of the segmentum Pacificus, Tempestus, and Solar, and both parts of Obscurus and Ultima, the Imperium Sanctus has Holy Terra at its heart. From here flows the psychic light of the Astronomicon, a magnificent golden beacon that shines through the madness of warp space to act as a guide for spaceships navigating that perilous realm. The Astronomicon's light is generated upon Terra by a vast choir of psychers, then focused and beamed forth by the Emperor himself. Hundreds of psychers die in agony each day as the effort burns out their minds. Such monstrous attrition is seen as a small price to pay to provide a guide by which humanity can navigate the galaxy. It is thanks to the light of the Astronomicon that, despite the opening of the Great Rift having whipped warp space into a hellish frenzy, and left countless Imperial worlds beset, the Imperium Sanctus continues to function. Throughout this immense region of the galaxy, Imperial worlds of every sort raise their tithes of military manpower and vital resources, sending them forth to bolster the armies of the Astra Militarum and feed the never-ending hunger of humanity's stellar empire. Space Marine strike forces surge from one war zone to the next, battling the deadliest threats to the Emperor's realm, while vast Imperial Navy battle fleets engage in blistering void wars against invasion swarms of every sort. Crusades of battle sisters bear the words of the ecclesiarchy into the fiery heart of battle, urging heretics against the imperial faith wherever they are found. Countless imperial agents work the emperor's will, overtly or secretly, throughout the Imperium Sanctus, while upon Mars and her countless subsidiary forge worlds, the tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus ward the arcane secrets of the Omnissiah. They use this dimly understood lore to fashion the technologies and weapons humanity's armies require to battle their foes. 
This is not to say that the Imperium Sanctus is a well-oiled machine. Only astropathic communication can bridge the vast distance between Imperial worlds. Passing from one straining warp-sensitive mind to another through the treacherous dimension of the Immaterium. This process of psychic messaging is heavy with symbolism, vagary, and inaccuracy. Worse still is the very monolithic bureaucracy by which the Imperium Sanctus is governed. Mindless and uncaring, glacially slow, machineries of administration grind all into dust. Millennia of historical learning are lost amidst dusty catacombs, sealed away behind barriers of religious censor. Response times to crises can often be measured in years, decades, even centuries. To this vast bureaucratic machine, the fates of entire worlds barely register, while individual lives mean less than nothing. The living beings of the Imperium are but grist for its ever-turning meal. A resource no different to the Prometheum that fuels its engine. The iron and adamantine that armors its warriors and war engines. And the protein gruel that feeds its armies in the field. Most of the men and women who populate this sprawling empire are born, live their lives of toil and fear, and eventually die from hardship, malnutrition, exhaustion, or some barely remarked upon industrial accident without ever having seen an alien, a heretic, nor even a warrior of humanity's armies. Crushed down by the oppressive dictatorial rule of imperial law, and comforted in whatever desperate fashion by the imperial faith. Every one of them has served their part in mankind's galactic war, just as does a bullet fired from a gun or a blade driven into an enemy's guts. Truly, only those who take to the stars to war or conquer in the Emperor's name stand any chance of seeing more of existence than this. And even then, much of what they witness is invariably horrific. For all its nihilistic misery and soulless oppression, the Imperium Sanctus continues to grind onwards. Its sheer weight and momentum carrying it forwards through tragedies unnumbered and hardships untold. This is humanity's every effort turned wholesale to sustaining total war, all the while praying to the Emperor that one day this nightmare may finally end. The Imperium Nihilus Vast tracts of Imperial space lie beyond the roiling warp storms that make up the Great Rift. Cut off from all but most of the determined aid, blind to the Astronomicon's light and beset upon all sides by legions of nightmarish foes, the worlds of the Imperium Nihilus must look to their own survival by whatever horrific means necessary. The region of space, known as the Imperium Nihilus, is cut off from Terra's light by the warp storms of the Great Rift. Not only is the light of the Astronomicon obscured by these raging tempests, but there are also only two comparatively stable channels through which Imperial fleets are able to cross the storm front. Even these shuddering gauntlets are haunted by empiric phantasms and piratical wolf packs. But there are at least safer than the narrow passages that open sporadically between the storm belts, only to be swept shut like a monster's jaws upon those brave or desperate enough to dare the crossing. 
Thus severed from the rest of the Emperor's realm, each world in the Imperium Nihilus must stand alone amidst the darkness. Many fell during the first nightmare's days of the Noctis Aeterna, when shock waves of psychic upheaval lashed the galaxy in the wake of the rift's opening. Planets and their populations were annihilated or twisted beyond recognition as warp storms engulfed them. Hordes of demons spilled from rents in the fabrics of reality to butcher and torment all of them. Heretical cults arose, prophesying the end of all things and whipping formerly loyal citizens into a murderous frenzy. Rampant mutation ran rife. Abominations were spawned from the darkest nightmares of men's minds, and entire populations turned on one another in self-destructive storms of violence and cannibalism. Other Imperial worlds held out. Fortresses rallied their garrisons, readied their weapons, and drove back attackers from within and without. Hardy, agri-worlders formed defense militias, vanishing into the wilds and fighting guerrilla wars against alien invaders. Industrial worlds drafted every man, woman, and child to churn out endless streams of material. Hurling wave upon wave of conscripted soldiery into the teeth of terrors from beyond the stars. Even still, for many worlds, death might have been the kinder fate. The Immaterium roils and churns, rendering warp travel catastrophic and perilous. Forced to wrestle with the spiteful empiric tides, wildly erratic destination flux, and dramatic temporal distortion, Imperial ships can risk only the shortest warp jumps, meaning that not only is the travel through the Imperium Nihilus terrifyingly dangerous, but it must also proceed at a virtual crawl. Interplanetary communication, too, has been almost entirely stifled. Forcing a message across the Imperium Nihilus requires Herculean and often fatal effort and even those missives that do make it to their intended recipients arrive in the form of recurring nightmares. Many worlds are wholly isolated, more than one population believing themselves the only surviving bastion of human civilization in the galaxy. Many planetary governors, military commanders, and religious leaders been forced to make terrible choices and commit monstrous deeds in order to keep the light of civilization burning upon the worlds they rule. Plagues of mutation, madness, and supernatural disease blossom while landscape warps and change beneath baleful skies. Malefic entities manifest seemingly at will to prey upon the unwary, while simple despair stalks every human soul. And while the great rift blazons itself across the firmament, corrupting all that its noxious light touches, though the human territories within the Imperium Nihilus are crippled, the same is not true of their enemies. Some Xenos races possess alternate methods, be they technological, biological, or seemingly sorcerous, by which they can traverse the stars while bypassing the warp altogether. Others revel in the madness that has been unleashed, joyriding the currents of empiric madness wherever fate wills and falling in howling tides upon whatever worlds lie in their path. That which blights imperial worlds, 
fleets and armies serve only to aid the worshippers of the dark gods. Even as it churns in madness, the warp sweeps these heretics and traitors along favorable tides, more often than not bearing them to their destination swiftly, if not safely. Surges of immaterial energies allow renegade psychers to enact unspeakable rituals that drag entire worlds into damnation, or translocate them into the hellish heart of the warp. Ancient and terrible beings not seen abroad in millennia feed off the raw energies of unbridled chaos, gathering the strength to force their way through the veil and fall upon humanity with howls of glee. Everywhere, hope fails. Still, the loyalist worlds of the Imperium Nihilus fight on, shoring up their faltering hope with unbridled hate. For every system swallowed by the darkness, a crusade blazes a trail across the stars to relieve the desperate defense of another. Space marine chapter planets, inquisitorial fortresses, and the Depta Sororitas preceptories shine as bright beacons of defiance amidst the shadows. Night worlds light their watchfires and weather the storm, just as they did during the dread millennia of old night. Meanwhile, daring rogue traders, dogged Adeptus Mechanicus explorator fleets, and courageous Imperial Navy flotillas brave the tumult of Immaterium to bring hope to lost worlds or claim new colonies for mankind. Perhaps the end of the galaxy draws nigh. Perhaps the darkness of the Imperium Nihilus will spread like a funeral shroud over all humanity's endeavors. However, while faith continues to burn strong, the defenders of the Imperium will not give in. The Emperor of Mankind to the vast majority of humanity, the Emperor is a God. He is the Divine Presence who sits the Golden Throne of Terra. He is Guider, Ruler, the higher power to which they offer their prayers for aid and deliverance. He is depicted and worshipped in myriad forms by souls beyond counting. Most would be driven mad with despair if they knew the truth. Ten thousand years have passed since the Emperor arose on Holy Terra. It was he that united the warring remnants of humanity and led them to reclaim their lost stellar empire. Records of that glorious age are gone ground to dust by the weight of passing eons, or lost amidst deeply buried and rune-sealed vaults that none now can open. What remains is allegory, myth, and religious scripture that tells of a great crusade to drive back the darkness of old night and replace it with the golden light of the Imperium. The Emperor's gene sons, the demigods known as Primarchs, led his armies of reconquest. Before them, no foe could stand. Eternal glory beckoned. Then came heresy. Then came the arch traitor Horus, the Emperor's fallen son. Horus made war upon his father's realm, leading fully half his mighty brothers into damnation alongside him, and in doing so, served the will of the dark and terrible chaos gods. 
tales tell of a devastating war that swept the stars. World after world burned as the Imperium tore at itself in maddened fury. And the angels of the Emperor battled the demons of chaos for possession of humanity's soul. At last, the arch traitor fell by the Emperor's hand, but not before he had crushed and rent his sire's body with his wicked talons. Legend tells that the Emperor ascended to his golden throne that day. His physical form was broken, sustained only by the device's arcane machineries. Yet his soul and his almighty psychic mind remained as powerful as ever. So began the Emperor's endless vigil over the human race. Though he could no longer walk abroad with his blazing sword and lead his armies to battle, still the Emperor shepherded and protected his people. Enshrined in countless ecclesiarchal sermons, illuminated texts, magnificent frescoes, and immense stained armor glass windows across the galaxy, that teaching remained central to the imperial faith. That the emperor shields mankind from harm, battling the demons of the warp in the spaces beyond reality. So long as his servants remain faithful to him, the emperor protects. In truth, the emperor is a carrion lord, his body long withered and decayed. The arcane machineries of the golden throne encase his physical remains entire and preserve them using stasis fields and psi fusion reactors. But of the godlike being he once was, only his supreme will remains. The Emperor cannot communicate with those who serve him, cannot issue commands or make his desires known. His rule is far more metaphysical in nature, for it is by his will that the dark terrors of chaos are prevented from overrunning humanity wholesale. Even as his mummified corpse writhes in eternal purgatory upon the golden throne, so his potent spirit still bestrides the warp and does battle with the endless tides of malefic beings that would otherwise burst forth to tear his people apart. The Emperor has given all he has so that his Imperium might endure. Though it has diverged greatly from the realm of strength and civilization that he envisioned, endure it does. The Emperor's throne room is arguably the most heavily protected location in the entire Imperium, ensconced at the very heart of the Imperial Palace on Terra. It is watched over by the golden armored giants the Adeptus Custodes, magnificent warriors whose bodies resonate with the incredible energies of genetic alchemy and whose entire existence is devoted to protecting the Emperor's physical personage and enacting his divine will. The palace itself is an immense fortress its bastions built atop the throne world's greatest mountain range. Its buttressed fortifications and enormous gun emplacements fit to see off armadas that could despoil entire star systems. The void around Terra throngs with fleets, vast orbital defense platforms, and void-borne minefields. For all of this, the Emperor is still imperiled. From the stars come invasion fleets beyond numbers. Heretics, aliens, and foul demons 
all hurling themselves against the defenses of the soul system in the hopes of breaking through to Terra itself. Worse still, though the finest magi of the machine god throng around the Golden Throne in never-ending communication, much of their ancient lore has been lost. There are none left in the Imperium capable of maintaining the throne's arcane systems, and now whispers hint darkly that they may be failing. Since his interment, the Emperor has had to consume the souls of hundreds of psychers a day to sustain his existence. But it is said that his appetite for life force is becoming insatiable. Does this mean his own is fading at last? If so, humanity is surely doomed. For if the Emperor dies, then his subjects will soon follow him into the abyss. Rule of the Imperium With the Emperor an inscrutable deific presence, the rule of his immense realm falls to the High Lords of Terra, known also as the Senatorum Imperialis. This conclave of supreme autocrats issues edicts in the Emperor's name, striving to maintain control of an ever more dystopian Imperium, with its all-consuming labyrinthian bureaucracy and its practically complex war zones. The Imperium is so vast, so thinly spread across nigh unimaginable cosmic distances, that by its very nature it defies centralized rule. It can take months, sometimes years, for a report, a distress call, or a cry for help to carry across the interstellar gulfs to Terra. Often, the deployment of a response takes even longer, thanks in no small part to the fickle and anarchic nature of warp travel. In practice, great swaths of the Imperium especially the more remote or hard-to-reach systems, must look to their own governors and soldiery for protection. It can be easy for those who dwell upon such isolated worlds to feel as though the wider Imperium is distant and holds little claim to their planet. However, just because the Emperor's realm is so vast, as to be all but ungovernable. This does not mean that its cyclopean, bureaucratic machineries do not aggressively continue to try. It is a foolish governor who considers themselves beyond the Emperor's gaze. Should a world dare diverge from the rigid status quo, it will be brutally repressed, punished and beaten back into line. Such measures are vital to the survival of the Imperium, for the Emperor's realm is beset on all sides. Examples must be made if every world is to toil as it must for the galactic war effort, and be kept free of the slightest chance of insurrection, heresy, or worse. The High Lords themselves always number twelve. Nine titles upon their council are considered virtually sacrosanct. Positions such as the Master of the Administratum, the Paternovo Envoy of the Navis Nobilite, and the Fabricator General of the Adeptus Mechanicus being always preeminent. Other positions vary, drawn from amongst the rarefied circles of Terra's great and good. It is their duty to attempt to interpret the Emperor's will and hope that his potent mind guides the choices they make. 
voices that routinely decide the fate of billions. Beneath the aegis of the High Lords lies the Adeptus Terra, the colossal bureaucratic engine of imperial governance that is itself broken down into myriad organizations. The largest of these is the Adeptus Administratum, which is comprised of many thousands of subdivisions. Through its vast military wing, the Departmento Munitorum, falls the duty of marshalling, supplying, and deploying the immense might of the Imperial War Machine. It is the task of the wider Administratum Meanwhile, to organize, administer, tithe, and archive the Imperium. A task so Sisyphean that their administrative backlog is centuries in arrears. The cogs of the Administratum grind ever onwards. However, burning through thousands of exhausted or insane acolytes every day. It is enough that the task is performed, and understanding is neither required nor welcome. There are many other organs of the Adeptus Terra, the Navis Nobilite, and its illustrious houses of sanctioned mutant navigators, the Adeptus Astra Telepathica, whose black ships prowl the Imperium in search of potential psychers, and whose Scholastica Psychina assesses and trains them, or else condemns them to be fed to the Emperor's Golden Throne. The Adeptus Astronomica, who trains the psychers that will take their places, generating the Astronomicon to guide the Imperial ships in the warp. The Adeptus Arbides, whose judges and arborators enforce the word of Imperial law, across the Emperor's realm. The Officio Assassinorum, which takes the most truly exceptional from amongst the human herd and transforms them into monstrous and highly specialized killing machine. The list goes on and on. Many autonomous and semi-autonomous bodies help to rule the Imperium through dogma and military might. The Adeptus Ministorum, Adeptus Mechanicus, Adeptus Astartes, Astra Militarum, Quester Imperialis, and others provide the strength of arms to enforce the High Lord's will. The Navis Imperialis sends fleets of warships out into the void following the trails blazed by the rapacious rogue traders of the Adeptus Astra Cartographica, while the agents of the Inquisition move through the shadows and fight hidden wars in the Emperor's name. Despite the combined efforts of these and other mighty bodies, only a small percentage of distress calls can be answered and only a fraction of threats met with appropriate force. It is the Imperium's own weight and ponderous momentum that carries it ever forwards, through millennia of disaster and cruelty, more than the actions of any one group. Angels of Death no greater symbol of imperial authority and military might exists than the Adeptus Astartes. Known to much of the Imperium as the Space Marines, or simply the Angels of Death, these post-human warriors strike with speed, skill, and overwhelming force against the deadliest threats to the Emperor's realm. It is said that there are 1,000 chapters of Space Marines, and that each of those chapters consists of 1,000 loyal battle brothers 
who stand ready to do the Emperor's bidding. In a realm as vast and disjointed as the Imperium, it is impossible to make such statements with even the faintest hope of surety. If this claim were true, however, it would mean that one space marine existed for every populated planet in the Emperor's realm. It speaks volumes of the abilities of the superlative warriors that the wider Imperium believes this number sufficient. The space marines act as sword and shield both. They strike from the heavens to shatter the armies and fastness of their foes as often as they defend the worlds of the Imperium with unshakable determination. Though their numbers are few, each space marine is a supremely skilled combatant whose body is enhanced through genetic alchemy and whose mind and soul are armored against fear, doubt, and despair. They are girded with the finest war gear the Imperium can provide and make war with a speed and ferocity few can match. To become a space marine is to become a living weapon. These warriors sacrifice much of their humanity in the name of protecting their species, leaving behind whatever existence they might otherwise have known in favor of endless war in the Emperor's name. In exchange, however, they become more than they could have ever been, and unless death and battle takes them first, they may live to fight for centuries in mankind's service. Space Marines are organized into chapters, each of which is a self-contained and largely self-sufficient army with its own monastic culture, heraldry, traditions, and favored tactics. Nearly every chapter rules over its own personal planet from a fortified fortress monastery of vast size and power. Those that do not instead maintain crusading fleets that ply the darkness of the void and hunt always for the next threat to humanity. Almost all space marine chapters are led by a chapter master, a storied exemplar of both martial might and strategic brilliance who wields greater power and autonomy even than a planetary governor. There is great variation in culture, philosophy, and even physical characteristics between space marine chapters, yet still common threads run through them. These can be traced back to the Primarchs, the mighty demigod sons of the Emperor himself. It was from samples of their genetic material that the original Space Marine Legions were created for the Great Crusade, and in accordance with the doctrines of a sacred tome known as the Codex Astartes, it was those legions that were broken down into myriad chapters during the historical Second Founding. Many, many more chapters have been created since in successive foundings, and all have been created using reserve stocks of the substance known as gene seed, which stems from the Primarchs of old. The most recent of these musters was known as the Ultima Founding, and it saw a new breed of space marine join the fight for the Emperor's realm. Known as Primaris Space Marines, these mighty warriors were fashioned in vast numbers over 10,000 years by Arch Magos Call, one of the most skilled and obsessive of all the Adeptus Mechanicus Magi. Call based his works on information from an ancient device known as the Sang Primus Portum, given to him by Rabute Gilliman, the Primarch of the Noble Ultramarines chapter. It was whispered that the portum contained secrets of the Emperor's own gene craft, 
and combined with the encyclopedic technological lore of Call himself, these secrets have allowed him to fashion still mightier Adeptus Astartes to continue the fight for humanity's survival. Their arrival is timely indeed, for never has mankind's realm been beset to this degree. It remains to be seen, however, whether even such powerful warriors as these can tip the scales. Warriors of the Faith The Adepta Sororitas, or Sisters of Battle as they are widely known throughout the Imperium, are the militant arm of the Ecclesiarchy. To them falls the duty of defending the Imperial Faith across all the Emperor's realms, purging heretics with bolt, blade, and flame, and launching star-spanning crusades to drive back the darkness that ever threatens to engulf humanity. Countless preachers, confessors, priests, and missionaries set out each year from the Imperial's cardinal worlds to spread the word of the Imperial faith. Their duty is to convert the heathen savages of fringe worlds, suborning their deviant belief systems and bringing them into the light of the Emperor by whatever means necessary. They march with Imperial armies, their booming rhetoric stoking the fires of faith in all loyal servants of the Emperor who can hear them. They move amongst the teeming populations of Imperial worlds, join interstellar expeditions into the darkest reaches of the Void, and ensure that more souls every day offer their heartfelt prayers to the God Emperor of mankind. By comparison, the duty of the Adepta Sororitas is singular. They look to the sanctity of the Imperial faith striking swiftly and mercilessly to eradicate any threat to their creed. As the purveyors of the single state-mandated imperial faith, it is unsurprising that the Adeptus Ministorum, commonly called the Ecclesiarchy, possesses wealth beyond the wildest imaginings of the most covetous miser. When it comes to their armed forces, however, the Ministorum are anything but frugal. Armored battle chapels and vast transatmospheric invasion cathedrums bear the battle sisters to war. They march out clad in power armor that bears many similarities to that of the Adeptus Astartes and wielding an array of equally destructive firearms and melee weaponry. Armored fighting vehicles, Baroque combat walkers, and devastating mobile artillery support them on the field of war. In all aspects of battle, from their rigorous training and preeminent spiritual purity to their potent material, the Battle Sisters exemplify the strength of the Imperial Faith and the fury of the God Emperor made manifest. Though in theory the Adepta Sororitas is the weapon of the Ecclesiarchy, in truth the militant orders take their direction from the most senior of their number, the Abbas Sanctorum. They are ruled from the Convent Prioris of Terra and the Convent Sanctorum on Ophelia Seven. With each Adepta Sororitas order operating from its own armored sanctuaries and retaining responsibility for its own parish, the majority of which span entire sectors of the Imperium. The Inquisition Few Imperial organizations are as shadowy in nature or as far-reaching in their power as the Ordos of the Inquisition. An Inquisitor 
has the authority to requisition whatever military or covert assets they require to complete their mission, to deploy private armies at will, and even unleash the ultimate sanction of exterminatus upon worlds considered lost to damnation. The duty of the Inquisitors is no less than to ensure, through whatever means necessary, the ultimate survival of the Imperium itself. With such a weight upon their shoulders, and such power at their command, it is unsurprising that these singular individuals are Machiavellian and utterly merciless. Many Inquisitors think nothing of mind-wiping or executing entire regiments, garrisons, or even planetary populations, if they believe the deed necessary. They act with the implicit authority of the Emperor's own hand. To deny them is death. The genetically encoded rosette that each Inquisitor carries emits vermilion-level clearance codes that leave no door locked against them, and no asset beyond their reach. Those who know that the Inquisition exists at all pale at the very whisper of its name, and with good cause. The Inquisition is not a single organization, but rather is broken down into a vast number of bodies known as Ordos. Each Ordo has its own focus and area of responsibility. Some are very broad, such as the witch-hunting Ordos Hereticus, or the expert alien slayers of the Ordo Xenos. Others are smaller or more specialized. The Ordo Sepulterum, for instance, was founded to understand and combat the supernatural diseases spread by the worshippers of the plague god Nurgle. The Ordo Kronos exists to monitor and swiftly neutralize contradictory time streams that are caused by the vagaries of warp travel. The Ordo Barbaris oversees pre-industrial human worlds and ensures that they do not fall into deviant worship. The Ordo Sicarius monitors the deeds and operatives of the Officio Assassinorum. There is even an Ordo Necros, whose purpose is shrouded in mystery, and an Ordo Vigilus that was founded solely to keep watch on the Ordo Necros. Each Ordo varies enormously in size, though in truth many inquisitorial operatives are so secretive in their ways that even the Ordos themselves can give no accurate accounting of how many agents make up their ranks. Though groups of inquisitors occasionally form like-minded conclaves, they more usually work alone often on extended undercover missions. More than one Inquisitor has been declared long dead, only to reappear decades, even centuries later, with their mission finally complete. By their very nature, Inquisitors are strong-willed, isolationist, and controlling individuals who rarely work well with peers. However, many do employ bands of hand-picked operatives whose particular skills, specialisms, or knowledge bases are deemed useful. These henchmen typically become fiercely loyal to their Inquisitor, and vary enormously in nature. Law enforcement officers, warrior bodyguards, adepts, and savants of all sorts are common amongst inquisitorial warbands. Stranger beings may also be seen, such as Xenos mercenaries, sanctioned psychers, cult assassins, and countless other unusual and deadly operatives. Such operatives work from the shadows on their inquisitor's behalf 
until he or she deems it time to unleash overt military force. Even within each ordo, there are vastly differing schools of thought, so much so that it is not uncommon for different ordos, or even individual inquisitors, to engage in silent wars with one another through the shadows of imperial worlds. The most common division lies between those inquisitors described as Puritan, those who cleave to the absolute letter of the Ordo's laws and operate within fiercely conservative parameters, and the radicals who view the tools, technologies, and lore of the Imperium's enemies as tools to be used for humanity's gain. Inquisitors reach such positions by degrees and may move from one school of thought to another during their years of toiling against the darkest horrors of the galaxy. One thing is always true. The longer an Inquisitor fights for the Imperium, the more they learn of the threats they face and the terrifying consequences of failure. The more extreme their methods become, and the harder it gets for them to discern right from wrong. Perils Unknown The Imperium is the largest and most powerful empire to span the stars since the days when the Necrontir warred with the ancient Aldari. The immensity of the Emperor's realm provides vast resources and martial strength yet it also brings humanity into conflict with countless enemies and ensures that every sector of the Imperium knows constant danger. Though official cartographs make the borders of Imperial space look clearly defined and secure, in truth they are in constant flux. Even the Segmentum Solar is not as unified and stable a human heartland as the administratum would have their subjects believe. While the further one travels from Holy Terra, the more rapidly Imperial space becomes wild and dangerous, pocked with vast regions outside of human control. The far-flung borders of such regions as the Halo Stars, the Veiled Region, and the Western Fringe are the wildest of all, with worlds falling to invasion or turning traitor as quickly as new planets can be claimed and settled by rapacious explorator fleets and daring rogue traders. Those loyal to the Imperium huddle behind their battlements and stare out at the dark void beyond, ever wary of the myriad perils that lie in wait in the darkness between the stars. For most, it is less a question of if some terrible threat will descend upon their world as when it will arrive and what monstrous form will it take when it does. Countless enemies lurk beyond the nominal borders of the Imperium, gathering their strength and choosing their moment to strike. The chaos-serving heretic Astartes are chief amongst these malevolent foes, turncoat space marines who rule over their own empires in the name of the Dark Gods, and descend upon the Emperor's realm to reap and plunder at will. Some ride the empiric tides of onrush and warp storms, while others launch piratical raids or gather together into immense invasion fleets commanded by some suitably powerful warlord. The most devastating examples of the latter have been the thirteen Black Crusades of Avedon the Despoiler, which between them shattered the linchpins of reality itself, and some say heralded the opening of the Great Rift. Xenos threats beyond number also surround the Imperium on every side. Humanity encounters strange and inimical species every day. From the mind-stealing enslavers, 
and the chronomanic crud through the thermoparasitic vigor. Some creatures are indigenous to a single world. Many more are barely above the level of predatory beasts or parasitic organisms. Dangerous, certainly, but not on a grand scale. More threatening by far are the Xeno species whose territorial empires span star systems and whose borders clash violently with those of the Imperium. The expansionists Tau Empire presses aggressively into the Imperium's eastern reaches. Barbarous orc invasions crash like bloody waves against the bulwark of humanity's defenses time and time again. Necron tomb worlds awaken, often beneath the feet of horrified Imperial settlers and their invasion fleets sweep down from space to swat aside humanity's defenses with arrogant ease and eradicate the Emperor's servants like vermin. Tyranid splinter fleets push into the galaxy from every side, writhing from the darkness like the tendrils of some immense beast and scouring all organic life that lies in their path. Meanwhile, new Xenos threats arise all the time. Fresh and monstrous terrors, emerging from the darkness beyond the Imperium's borders to plunge human worlds into anarchy and apocalypse. The Enemy Within Countless perils lurk within the bounds of the Emperor's realm. The hardship of daily life plants seeds of resentment and rebellion in minds made fertile through suffering. Mutant monsters and concealed foes stalk the shadows, and the ravings of twisted demagogues lead the faithful into damnation. Against these threats, humanity must be ever vigilant. For all the unholy threats prowling beyond the frail lights of imperial civilization, many believe that it is the darkness lurking within that civilization itself that presents the greatest danger to the Emperor's realm. From twisted instabilities and unnatural deviance to demon worshipping cults, tech heresy, and xenophile traitors, Myriad enemies rise from amongst the human herd with every passing day. Piracy and sedition are a constant threat, of course. The rule of imperial law is harsh, and many are unwilling to exist within its strictures. Even without the corrosive effects of chaos worship and full-blown heresy, many ship captains Astra Militarum regiments and planetary governors give in to the lure of disloyalty with every passing year. Their punishment may be slow in coming, for the Imperium is lumbering and monolithic. It always comes eventually, however, and the sentence is invariably death. Mutation is another widespread scourge that lurks in the dark corners of countless imperial colonies, outposts, hive cities, and industrial sprawls. Its causes are myriad, industrial runoff and toxic environs, iterative generations exposed to strange planetary conditions, alien radiation, Simple genetic deviation, or most insidious of all, the warping influence of chaos. This last has become a more pressing danger than ever since the opening of the Great Rift. It is at the heart of why the Imperium is almost entirely intolerant of mutation. While a useful strange of abhumans such as ogrins, ratlings, or navigators are officially sanctioned. The curse of mutation is normally met with violent abhorrence, lest such rampant deviance be a sign of dangerous warp taint. 
The people of the Imperium are taught to hate, fear, and revile the mutant, and failure to report such abominations is considered tantamount to heresy. Of course, such a culture of intolerance serves to drive vast numbers of otherwise sane and loyal abhumans to desperate measures, and has ushered countless lost souls in the arms of the Dark Gods over the millennia. In an era of such all-pervading war, however, the Imperium can ill afford the weakness of mercy. Not all heretics are mutants, however. Amidst the grinding misery of the dystopian Imperium, there are countless reasons that a human soul might turn to the worship of chaos. Some seek release from lives of slavery, poverty, and hopeless, endless toil. Others desire power or influence, whether to provide for those who depend upon them or to have revenge themselves upon those who have oppressed or mistreated them. Few who fall to the honeyed promises of the dark gods truly start out as evil. However, it is a slippery slope of morally compromising choices that lead from desperation or idealistic recidivism to full-blown heresy. Cults beyond number gather in the dark corners of hive cities to worship deities. Primitive priests work forbidden blood rites upon frontier worlds. Imperial nobles fall to hedonistic pleasure sects while twisted misinterpretations of imperial scripture lead unwriting practitioners into summoning rituals that can damn worlds. The Dark Gods The gods of chaos dwell within the endless and infinitely mutable realm of the warp. Ancient entities of unimaginable power and infinite malice, they look upon real space with covetous eyes and scheme endlessly for its overthrow. There are four of these monstrous beings each an exemplar of mortal obsessions and fears, each certain that they, and they alone, should rule all. In the warp, similar thoughts and emotions gather like rivulets of water. They form streams and eddies of anguish and desire, pools of hatred and torrents of pride. Since the dawn of time, these tides have flowed through the warp. Such is their power that they formed creatures made of the very stuff of dreams and nightmares. Eventually, these instinctual, formless beings gained a rudimentary consciousness. The Chaos Gods were born. Vast psychic presences made from the fantasies and horrors of mortals. As the races of the galaxy prospered and grew, so too did their hopes and dreams, their rage and wars, their love and hatred. This burgeoning flood of raw emotion fed the nascent chaos gods and nurtured their unholy power. Eventually, the gods reached back to their makers, into and through the dreams of mortals. Soon, seeing the fruits of their labors, they began an eternal venture to influence the physical realm and its myriad races. A chaos god grows in power through the actions and thoughts of mortals. Those who worship such a dark god and behave in a way that feeds it are rewarded with strange gifts, extraordinary power, and potentially, immortality. The chaos gods battle one another constantly in the warp, hurling endless armies of their demon followers into conflict across the ever-changing hellscapes of the realm of chaos. So too do their mortal followers make war across real space, 
fighting always to further the goals of their patron deity, in the hope that their reward will elevate them to greater power. Horn. Horn is the blood god, embodying battle, bloodshed, and senseless rage. His followers depict him most commonly as a towering and monstrously feud warrior clad in brazen armor. Seated upon an immense throne of brass, sat atop a mountain of trillions of mortal skulls. Horn's head is styled as that of a bestial warhound from whose nostrils spurt smoke and flame, and whose grotesque features are half hidden by a skull-like helm. His feet are pictured as cloven hooves. His eyes are fiery crimson pits of the deepest and most intense hatred imaginable. At Korn's side is shown the greatest and most destructive sword ever created, known across the galaxy as Woe Bringer, War Maker, and the End of All Things. It is said that when Korn swings this titanic blade, he can hack apart the stuff of reality itself, allowing his frenzied demon legions to spill forth. It is the creed of Korn's worshippers that he desires eternal war and endless bloodshed. He cares not whether it is his own warriors or those of his many enemies who plead, only that the blood continues to flow. The Lord of Battle's wrath is infinite. They say his hatred and bloodlust utterly is unquenchable. His temple is the battlefield, his altar the blazing trench, bloodied arena, or shell-blasted city. All who make war worship corn by their deeds, whether they intend to or not. In this age of ceaseless galactic conflict, the blood god has grown mighty indeed. Zinch Known by such titles as the Changer of the Ways, the Great Sorcerer, and the Architect of Fate, Zinch is the patron deity of change, destiny, and unbound sorcery. His worshippers empower their god through manipulation and politicking, and by their desire for continual change and reshaping of reality. Depicted as an ever-shifting being whose flesh crawls with laughing, whispering, sobbing, prophesying, and lying faces, Zinch is shown crowned by sweeping horns wreathed in arcane fire and surrounded by nebulae of magical energies which twist and change to show those places and people upon whose fate the deity muses. Zinch's worshippers know that he has plans of his own, schemes of insane, labyrinthine complexity fit to drive even the most ferociously intelligent mortal minds to madness. The change god's servants labor constantly to fulfill his ineffable plots, and their purposes and deeds often seem like utter lunacy to their enemies until the precise moment they come to spectacular and bloody fruition. Nurgle Grandfather Nurgle is said to be as generous as he is malignant, for he is the source of every disease, pestilence, parasite, and epidemic ever to trouble mortal beings. Nurgle is rarely described as a spiteful god, but rather he sees his plagues as gifts, given freely so as to maintain the endless fecund cycle of death, decay, and unbound life that follows in its wake. He is commonly depicted as a vast hulk of rotting, parasite-riddled flesh 
through which an infinite number of diseases and vast swarms of plague mites run rampant. His boil-pocked skin is leathery and green, while the bloated innards that spill through its rinse are said to give off a stench that can rot reality itself. Nurgle is depicted as hunched over his cauldron of poxes, humming cheerfully to himself as he brews up another infectious concoction with which to bless the mortal races of real space. The plague god's realm within the immaterium is depicted as a monstrous garden of unimaginable foulness and rampant life. Amongst foated swamps and bloated plant life, his demons gamble and trudge, and the land itself can spill through into the real space, when enough disease, entropy, and misery is concentrated upon a single point. Nurgle's power fluctuates the most of all the Chaos Gods. At its apex, when his metaphysical epidemics ravage the stars, only to fall into remission when the tides of sickness burn themselves out. Yet he always rises again, for entropy is everlasting. Slanesh Slanesh is the Dark Prince, the hideously beautiful embodiment of excess in all its mortal forms. His is the power of endless temptation, of even the most virtuous beginnings transformed and perverted into hideous vice. Arrogance, lust, greed, sadism, desire, ambition, all serve to feed the Dark Prince's power. Yet so too does any excess of love, generosity, determination, or pride. In short, as soon as a mortal being's efforts pass into the realms of obsession, they give worship to Slanesh, however inadvertently. Depictions of Slanesh vary depending upon what speaks loudest to the worshipper's hidden desires. The Dark Prince is most often described in human lore as an androgynous and lissom figure, guileless in their innocence, yet with the eyes that instantly steal the soul of any mortal who dares look into them. Slanesh's domain within the realm of chaos is said to be a vast palace of pleasure that resides at the heart of six concentric circles of temptation. Each of these perverse realms appears at first glance to be a paradise devoted to a different mortal desire, be it vain glory, gluttony, lust, sloth, or any other obsession. Yet in truth, each is a hellish snare intended to waylay those who would invade the Dark Prince's territory and trap them forever in the torments of their own making.